The following podcast is a presentation of This is Infamous. Listener discretion is advised. What's going on out there, everybody, ladies and gents? Thanks very much for tuning into this brand new episode of Intelligent Wrestling Conversation, where we like to take our wrestling speak and inject it with some logic, some reason, some intelligence. No fanboy speak allowed here on this particular program. I'm your host, Billy Donnelly, who you can find regularly at JoeBlow.com, as well as ThisIsInfamous.com. Show's coming to you a little bit later this week than usual. Had to take a trip up to Orlando this week. That's right. Visited Full Sail University, Full Sail Live, for another round of NXT tapings. So we'll get into that a little bit later in the show. I got some beef this week that I'm going to lay down on that NXT fan base again. So you got that to look forward to. A couple other things we're going to run through on this week's show. I'm going to talk about what I saw at last NXT taping that I attended, which now you finally had a chance to catch up with this week on NXT programming on the WWE Network. And then, of course, being the dream match between Finn Balor and Shinsuke Nakamura. Also going to get into the Cruiserweight Classic. We'll talk a little bit of WWE Draft throughout the show. But I want to kick off with the one thing that everybody who's a wrestling fan was talking about this particular week, particularly last weekend... And that was UFC 200 and Brock Lesnar showing inside the octagon. Dude's a monster. Dude's a beast. The beast. But we already knew that, didn't we? We already knew Brock Lesnar was the beast incarnate. The conqueror. The mayor of Suplex City. A freak of nature. To a degree. But what we didn't know was how after several years away from MMA fighting, how Brock Lesnar would look returning to the octagon for what they would like to call a quote-unquote one-off. The co-main event at UFC 200. Just beneath the women's bantamweight title defense. Where Misha Tate just got housed. But I want to talk about the Brock Lesnar fight. Because I think there's a lot... There's a lot of interesting issues now stemming from the Brock Lesnar fight. Now, officially, last week, the WWE announced that Brock Lesnar would be facing Randy Orton at SummerSlam. They perfectly timed that to lead in and coincide with UFC 200 so that they can use their ad placement on the UFC's pay-per-view to really sort of draw some interest, draw some buys for the network, for people to watch SummerSlam, to once again watch more of Brock Lesnar. But I think the interesting thing coming out of UFC 200 was how dominant Brock Lesnar was in the octagon in his fight against Mark Hunt. Because that now makes you wonder what the future of Brock Lesnar is in the UFC. You know, I I mentioned the language they kept talking about for Brock Lesnar's fight, which was that this is a one-off, this was a special occasion. You know, we had all sorts of speculation as far as what Brock Lesnar was getting paid, what the WWE was getting out of this deal, whether this was a thing for Vince McMahon to really just keep Brock Lesnar happy and keep him in the WWE system as opposed to unhappy and wanting to walk away to do something else, regardless of his contractual obligations. We 
the backstage mystery surrounding Brock Lesnar's involvement with the UFC. That was a real compelling story because it was so much in the shadows. Very mysterious, very secretive. But after watching Brock Lesnar dominate Mark Hunt through three rounds on the way to unanimous decision at UFC 100, you have to think this can't be the last time we're going to witness Brock Lesnar in the octagon. You know, I think, I think had Brock Lesnar lost, had Brock Lesnar gone to the UFC, gone to UFC 200, stepped into the octagon with Mark Hunt, and lost, he would have been able to say to himself, well, at least I tried. At least I knew or was able to find out if I had what it takes to compete at a high level in the UFC anymore. And I think that would have been the end of it. I think he would have said, okay, I tested my medal. I'm going back into the squared circle and I'll make my living that way. I think that would have been it. I think had it been a close fight, Brock Lesnar would have said, you know, maybe I just lost a step. Maybe I don't have it as much anymore. But once again, at least I put my money where my mouth is and I was able to find out. No regrets. But because Brock Lesnar went into the octagon at UFC 200 and he dominated Mark Hunt on every conceivable level, I think... This is now the opportunity for us to potentially see a WWE UFC crossover box office phenomena. Because I don't think Brock Lesnar is done in the UFC. And can contractual obligations be damned? I don't think that Vince McMahon can stop him. Nor... Can I see any legitimate reason why he would want to? I think that going into this, Vince McMahon saw the opportunity to keep Brock Lesnar happy, to keep him pleased, to be able to allow him to do something that he wanted to do in the name of having a satisfied employee under his wing. And now, he has somebody who is not only a draw to him in the WWE, but who, via using him as a major draw in the UFC, can help attract eyes coming back to the WWE product. That's what they were able to do with UFC 200. That's what I think they could do in the future. And while I understand they would rather him focus on the WWE more, while I understand they would like him to have more dates to show up on WWE programming or at WWE shows, I think this actually maximizes the reach of Brock Lesnar to lure in Viewers that they otherwise might not get. And I don't think if Brock Lesnar comes back to Vince McMahon and says, I want to go fight in the Octagon again, that Vince McMahon is going to tell him no. He may look at it or approach the deal from a different angle and say, well, how can I maximize what I'm going to get out of it potentially in a financial sense. But I think this is an extraordinary opportunity for the WWE to try and take advantage of in riding the coattails of Brock Lesnar's success. See, the last time they let Brock Lesnar get away because Brock Lesnar was unhappy being on the road all the times that he was. And he wanted to go on and say, let's see if I can explore other challenges. Tried out for football, for the Minnesota Vikings, ultimately 
made his way to MMA and the UFC. And I think the WWE, and particularly Vince McMahon, has always looked back and said, man, I wish we could have kept that guy happy somehow. Maybe we take him off the road a little bit. Maybe we make the schedule a little less demanding on him. Maybe we figure out a way to keep him happy. Even if it's a double standard with the other talent that we have on the roster, that we have under contract, this guy is special. And while Brock Lesnar was a freak athlete in his first run in the WWE, there's something different to him now because he is a monster. He is a beast. He was the next big big thing then. He's a beast now. And he's a credible competitor being able to cross over between the UFC and the WWE, particularly because when he goes to the UFC, he wins. And I understand heading into this fight, the bout with diverticulitis, the sickness, the illness that really diminished his athleticism and what he was able to do competing at a high level in the UFC. So you can, to a degree, say, well, maybe the mystique of Brock Lesnar was gone or slighted somehow. But the fact that he came out of UFC 200 and dominated Mark Hunt raises that bar again, makes him a legitimate competitor again. The only problem I see for the WWE is trying to find other credible competitors that they can stick into the ring with Brock Lesnar who look like they may be a legitimate threat to him. Because even though this is one of their big matches for SummerSlam this year in Brooklyn, I don't really see Randy Orton as an even match for Brock Lesnar. And look, Brock Lesnar said as much as he could possibly say in his post-fight press conference after UFC 200 where he said that Brock Lesnar is going to do what Brock Lesnar wants to do. And that damn well is the truth. Because if Brock Lesnar goes to Vince McMahon and says, I want to fight, he's going to figure out a way to fight. And Vince McMahon is a smart man. And he's going to figure out how to make that work. And it stems from the fact that Brock Lesnar won. Because now, the sky is the limit. And while this was a taste of the octagon, and that's what it was, a taste, I think Brock Lesnar wants more. I I think Brock Lesnar wants to see how far he can take this, how far he can go, how far he can rise. Can he once again compete for a title in the UFC? Can Brock Lesnar once again be a champion in the UFC? And if so, how long will his reign be? How many title defenses will he have? See, a win only really scratches the surface of what Brock Lesnar's ceiling is in the UFC, and I don't think you can cut that off. I don't think Brock Lesnar wants to cut that off. I don't think Vince McMahon wants to try to make Brock Lesnar cut that off. The UFC certainly doesn't want Brock Lesnar to cut that off. So I think right now the situation, as it pertains to Brock Lesnar, the WWE, and the UFC, is that the potential is there for everyone to win in a big way. And you could look at the WWE and say, well, that's not fair to the other guys. This guy's just part-time and he can kind of do what he wants and there's a double standard. You know what? If Brock Lesnar is on a WWE show or WWE pay-per-view and that means more buys, more subscriptions to the WWE network, more tickets sold, more merch sold, Everything that comes with Brock Lesnar being on the show because now he has a bigger audience being able to branch out into the UFC. I'm pretty sure no one in there is complaining about it when they look at their paycheck. I do not believe for one second we have seen the last of Brock Lesnar competing in the octagon. I don't know when we will see it again. 
SummerSlam is next. Randy Orton is next. But I think right now, this is a really interesting situation for all parties involved, and they can all come out of this in really good shape with a lot of money, an increase in audience, and good standing all around. The UFC would be happy to have WWE fans who don't necessarily watch on a regular basis tune into their shows, into their programming, into their pay-per-views. And the WWE would be more than happy to get UFC watchers to tune into the WWE because Brock Lesnar is there. And even when Brock Lesnar is there, if you can lure them to your programming with Brock Lesnar and maybe catch their eye with something else, now you have a new audience. So, look, this is a good situation for everybody. They're going to figure out how they make it work going forward. But this, we have not seen the last of Brock Lesnar when it comes to fighting in the octagon in the UFC. You can bet your ass on that. I promise you. I guarantee it. All right, let's see where we want to go from here. I guess we should talk about the WWE draft because that's the main thing that's on the way. Next week, SmackDown goes live. And they're going to kick it off with the brand extension draft, the brand split draft, which as we found out this past week on Monday Night Raw, Stephanie McMahon will be at the helm for Monday Night Raw. Shane McMahon will be at the helm for SmackDown. And this coming week, we will learn who their regular general managers will be. I guess we're going back to the general managers. But who will who will run the day-to-day of those shows with them being the boss? Now, what I will say, prior to the rosters being drawn up, is if you're a wrestling fan who's sort of been down on Monday Night Raw as of late. I'm I'm sort of one of them. Just sort of down on the on the program, down on the show. Just doesn't 3 hours feels like a slog. It doesn't feel very exciting. Feels very paint by numbers, by the book constantly. I think with the way the shows have now been set up to compete against one another with Shane McMahon sort of promising change, 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 a new way of doing things for SmackDown. I think next week with the brand extension, this is your out for Monday Night Raw. This is your chance to find something else that may light that fire under you, that may inspire your wrestling passion again. Because I think Raw, the way that it's just going to continue to move forward is sort of just the same old, same old. Same way of doing things, same sort of segments. Just the same, the same, the same. Very familiar. And if you like that, if you've been in, in tune with what Raw has been doing, great for you. I think, I think Raw will continue to meet your expectations. But I think there's real potential for SmackDown to do something different. Maybe feature more wrestling, more in-ring. Maybe less drama, so to speak. Maybe give things a different look. Shoot things a little differently. Have a different sound, as opposed to Raw's more storytelling aspects. Maybe SmackDown is much more focused on the play-by-play. Feel more like a wrestling show. I think that's where I'm sort of looking at these two shows as they're going to line up, is I think Raw is going to be more just the WWE entertainment type of show, and I think SmackDown is going to be the more wrestling show. I think it's going to be sort of a mix between what NXT is and what Raw is. So something in the middle. Split the difference between them. And I think we'll be, in many ways, what SmackDown is. It will be a lot of what Raw is not.
So the draft is coming up on Tuesday, and there's still a lot of questions. How what, how are the titles going to work? It's a title situation. I think there's going to be two world titles because they're making two distinct brands. So it does make sense to have a champion on Raw and a champion on SmackDown. How the secondary titles work, that's a different question. What do you do with the tag division? What do you do with the women's title? What do you do with the Intercontinental? What do you do with the U.S.? How do those titles work? Do the titles follow the people? Do the people move across when they're the champion? Do they have to pull double duty? So there's some questions there. But I think, and I did this, you can find it on my Twitter. Uh, so you follow me at Infamous Kid on Twitter. You can find my fantasy draft results. I went into the WWE sort of draft setup, and you can actually split the roster how you want. You can send people to Raw, send people to SmackDown, and conduct your rosters. And I did. I did do that. I did that to try and see if if I could make a compelling split of talent that would make for interesting stories with Raw being the vision of still Raw as it is now and SmackDown being sort of the more wrestling driven, more in-ring product driven show. And I think I got a pretty good mix. In fact, with SmackDown, I think it was starting to lean maybe towards that being my show, if it sort of fits what I think they might do with it. I did kind of, you know, put the guys I didn't want on Raw if I'm just going to, you know, watch one show maybe a week. I should have maybe split it maybe a little bit more evenly just so, you know, for the WWE's sake that I watch both shows. But I think there's real potential for star power from from people who haven't really um, gotten the main event spotlight. And I think with the brand extension, there is a potential for for freshness, things we haven't seen before yet. And more of it. You know, Cesaro and AJ Styles... Sami Zayn and Seth Rollins. Kevin Owens and shit. Put him on whatever roster. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do is going to be great. But you, you know what I mean? Like, there are feuds, matchups, things we haven't seen in a long time that I think the brand extension is good for. But it got me also thinking of who I want on these different shows. Who I think is going to be drafted in a high position. Who I think the shows are going to be built around. And I think, you know, there are some people you're going to have to factor into being called up in prominent positions. I think Finn Balor is going to be a major player as he gets called up. But it's also putting people in a position to find success, too. You know, Finn Balor is still a smaller guy. His promos are okay. Has really good in-ring work. So putting him somewhere where he's going to succeed. You know, putting him in the ring with guys who can work with him to maximize all their potential. So I think a show like Raw is more likely to be built around, you know, John Cena, Roman Reigns. You may put Cesaro in there. I think he's he's sort of earned a spot to see if he can rise up uh, to the next level on, on a prominent show like Raw. And on something like SmackDown, I think the club would be best served. Sami Zayn. Finn Balor, I think, would be great on SmackDown. So I think, look, I think the draft is going to be really interesting. There's a lot of potential here to do something really cool. And it's going to take some time. So you can't, we can't look at this on next week. And, and we'll talk about the draft and the way the rosters are laid out and the results next week. We'll break it down on next week's show. But I think heading in, we can't be knee-jerk. This isn't like the NFL or the NBA 
where they don't pick the guy that you want, you just boo him and you rip on that guy and you're like, well, prove me wrong. A lot of these people are established. They're established in the WWE universe. And remember, everybody has a role to play on the card. Not everybody's going to be the main event. You're going to have your up your 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 main eventers, you're going to have your upper mid carters, your mid carters, your lower mid carters, your current jerkers. You're going to have a whole lot of range on the show and Hopefully, if the rosters are balanced well enough, you will have the potential for social mobility on there to be able to sort of move up from the mid card to the main event like you used to be back in the day if you were popular and drawing well. To have people be able to move through those tiers so you will constantly have interesting programs interesting feuds personal issues so i really look forward to next week's show i really look forward to next tuesday night i look forward to smackdown going live and i look forward to the draft and see how that show launches as a result i do maybe feel slightly bad for those in attendance at the draft on tuesday i don't know that it's going to be a very exciting show to be at to have paid for for tickets I think you may actually get a better experience sitting at home watching it. And I hope they treat it like an actual draft. Get a panel of your experts. Get them lined up to talk about what the picks mean. And strengths and weaknesses. And why, you know, somebody might be a good pick or somebody might be a bad pick. You know? Undersell expectations on some. Overspell expectations on some. So that if somebody feels like a bust and they rise up against it, the audience feels the emotion of that. They get invested in a character who sort of proves the experts wrong. So I think there's potential for the draft. I think there's potential for everything coming out of the draft. There's potential for the brand extension. I do think we're going to get two distinctly different feeling shows. I think when all is said and done, SmackDown may be my show of choice with the two if I get something that just feels fresh and does everything that Raw doesn't. But we're also going to have to give it time. Let them work. Let them build this thing. six months eight months 12 months go by the shows feel the same the shows feel sort of flat you're just not enthused or excited about it then we can go back and revisit whether or not this is a good idea but in two weeks three weeks a month six weeks we're not gonna know we won't know by SummerSlam. probably not gonna know by survivor series by the royal rumble maybe we'll start to get an idea of how this thing is coming together So don't be so quick to judge. Don't be so quick to judge how the picks are selected. Don't be so quick to judge how the rosters are assembled. We'll see how things shake out as the wheels get in motion for Raw. As the wheels get in motion for SmackDown. But you gotta let them start to roll for a while first. And the WWE also needs to sort of let this thing go and ride it out. They've committed, so commit. Don't shortchange it. Don't second guess it. Don't doubt it. Don't scratch your head at it. "Mm -hmm, I don't know. You've made this thing happen. Commit to it. Ride it out and always try to put the best possible program you can put forth on any given week for both shows and if it's good if it's compelling if it's interesting if it's exciting the audience will find it and they will embrace it they will gravitate towards it and they will support it but if you lose confidence in it we'll lose confidence in it and your whole house of cards is going to crumble So those are my thoughts on the draft as we head into next Tuesday. All right, let's talk about um, 
Let's talk about the Cruiserweight Classic before we get into NXT so we could sort of do an extended uh, conversation about NXT this week. Uh, Cruiserweight Classic, uh, first uh, block of matches from the first round uh, aired this week on the WWE Network. Uh, I was in attendance for the entire first round of tapings when they went on a few weeks back. Um, Some really good matches for you guys to be able to watch, that's for sure. And I think if you tuned in to the first four matches that were broadcast uh, last night, that you got a pretty interesting mix uh, and a good display of talent to really get you interested in what they were doing um, to get the the Cruiserweight Classic tournament underway. So you had uh, Cedric Alexander versus Clement Patois. You had uh, Ho-Ho Lun and uh, Aria Davari. You had Grand Metallic versus Alejandro Saez. And you also had Kota Ibushi versus Sean uh, Maluda. Four really good matches. That really sort of set the tone for what was going to happen. Now, to my recollection, um, those matches weren't shown in the order that they were taped. Um, In addition, they're sort of taking the 16 matches and figuring out how to block them together. When we saw the taping, it was like a four-hour taping. It was 16 matches. Uh, by the third hour, you were kind of exhausted. Um, we rallied for the fourth hour because they stacked it with some bigger names. But they're going to pair the matches up well to give you a balanced hour of programming when you tune in to watch it on the network. So you got four weeks of this, and then you're going to move into... This, this, the second round and then the quarterfinals and the semifinals and the finals as, as we continue to go. But you had four really good matches. Kota Ibushi and Sean Maluda, I thought, were, were a really good pair. And I've heard some people say, well, you know, this Sean Maluda guy was pretty good. Why do you stick him in there with Kota Ibushi, who's got to be the favorite to win this thing? It is because Sean Maluda can work, at least, with Kota Ibushi. You can't stick Kota Ibushi in there with a guy who has no business being in the ring with Kota Ibushi because then they all look bad. So even though Sean Maluda is quite talented, and it sucks that maybe he's one and done in the tournament, the idea is to make Kota Ibushi look like a real contender to win this thing. And if you stick him in there with a lesser talent, and there are definitely some lesser talents that you'll see in future shows, it doesn't help anyone. But that Ibushi Maluda match, a really good match. Grand Metallic and Alejandro Zayas was a really good match. Cedric Alexander is fantastic. And while I would have liked Aria Davari to have captured a win, because I I need some kind of heels in my tournament, Ho Ho Lun is a is a really nice underdog to stick in the middle of this thing and see how far he might be able to get. As I mentioned, having seen the tapings, I think the presentation of the Cruiserweight Classic is really interesting. Uh, The way that they are sort of explaining who these guys are, they're giving them some packages to understand where they came from, what their skills are, what their talents are. It gets you uh, at least familiar with the guys in the ring so you're not just watching for wrestling's sake. I think that's very cool. I like the idea of sort of treating this like a legitimate athletic competition, bringing both guys to the center of the ring, referee issuing instructions to both of them, having a handshake of sportsmanship, bringing them in after the match to raise one's hand. I think all of that, as far as the presentation, is great. I think Mauro Ronaldo is the perfect guy to call these because he has wrestling knowledge. It's like sticking Joey Styles in there to an extent because he understands what's happening in the ring. He can call the action, and I think this is well-suited to his skill set. He knows wrestling. 
and is able to sort of suck you into the emotions of a match with his passion for it. I love Mauro Ronello as an announcer. I love him as a wrestling announcer. I think he's really good for this tournament. And I think Daniel Bryan, what you'll see over the weeks is he's going to get a little bit more comfortable. Going to get a better feel for his role as a color guy, as an analyst, as a former competitor weighing in on what these guys are doing in the ring. So, look, I, I, you're, you're going to have weeks upon weeks now in the Cruiserweight Classic, and I think this is a really good start. So, if you haven't checked out the Cruiserweight Classic yet, I haven't checked out uh, the first block of matches for round one, get over the network and do so. Really good in-ring stuff. You're going to see guys do things that you don't normally see on Raw and SmackDown, and I think that really plays to the strength of why the Cruiserweight Classic was set up. It's going to showcase a lot of guys, a lot of potential future talent for the WWE. So, the Cruiserweight Classic, a really cool concept, period, and I think you'll get a lot of joy out of it as a wrestling fan. All right, with that said, let's move on to NXT. Because the last time I went up to Full Sail... I went for two nights. I went for back-to-back tapings. Cruiserweight Classic and a regular set of NXT tapings. That of which culminated in the dream match of Finn Balor versus Shinsuke Nakamura. Now, if you watch NXT the past couple weeks, you'll see my face kind of dead center in the ring. I mean, I'm in the crowd, but like, if you look at the ring, you're not going to be able to miss my beautiful bearded face in the NXT Full Sail crowd. And you definitely couldn't avoid it last night, watching Finn Balor and Shinsuke Nakamura go head-to-head one-on-one. My face is all over that thing. It's right there. It's my gift to you. Drink it in, man. All right, with that said, though, Unbelievable match. Now, I think Nakamura and Sami Zayn at TakeOver Dallas, overall, better match. Number one, your first experience really with Nakamura stateside and in the NXT forum. So, they were sort of a discovery excitement that goes along with it. But I think Balor and Nakamura just told a... I think they also told a really good story here. And there's also the emotion to this match that this is sort of Finn Balor's NXT swan song. You know, this is sort of his farewell to NXT. It was his farewell to the arena at Full Sail University. It was his swan song in NXT. This was it. This was his thank you very much for everything that you've done. Let's send you out, even with a loss, but on a real high note. To be able to give the fans this in such an intimate setting. And if you watch that match back, sort of with that feeling in your back pocket, that like, this is it for Finn Balor and NXT... I think it amps up the emotions of the match a little bit more. And here's the here's the beauty of the match is that going in you kind of know that Nakamura is going to win the match. You kind of know that what NXT wants to do is line up Nakamura and Samoa Joe for TakeOver in Brooklyn over SummerSlam weekend. You kind of get the feeling now that the belt has been taken off of Finn Balor and put off onto Samoa Joe's waist that he's going to be called up to the main roster and find a slot either on Raw or SmackDown. So with all of these things that you kind of know... In this particular match between Nakamura and Balor, you're able to suspend so much of that. So much of the 
Smart Mark knowledge. To embrace the moment. To live in the story that they're telling you. To suspend disbelief. And to truly believe that Finn Balor may walk out of this match with his hand raised, victorious as he rides off into the sunset. And this is one of those situations, this is one of those cases where I tell people all the time that predictable isn't bad if the story being told to get there is very good. We know that A goes to B. We know it. It's the way that it is. But if you can make the journey from A to B so compelling, then it doesn't matter that we're going to B. We know that we're going to B anyway. But let me get lost along the way. Let me get lost in the adventure. In the journey. In the magic. And I thought Balor and Nagamora did that so beautifully. In that you embraced both of these guys and were able to lose yourself in the emotion of this dream match. And it is. It truly is a fantastic match to watch. And Nakamura, as I've said countless times is a guy that seems to get better every time you watch him and I don't mean that he gets better on an individual level I just mean the more you watch him the more you realize how amazingly good he is at what he does the charisma the showmanship the theatrics he just gets it he understands how to open up his hand, how to take the audience and put it right into the palm of his hands and how to hold them there for an extended period of time and make them react and emote however it is that he wants them to. And I think, especially having seen him live on a, on a several occasions now since he's been signed to NXT, I think that's real, really where the true appreciation of how good Nakamura is. Finn Balor, you can see all the time and understand how good he is. But I think Nakamura, very much like Samoa Joe, is a guy who is not done the full justice unless or until you see them live. See, I'd seen Samoa Joe on TV tons of times, and I had said to myself, all right, he seems pretty good, but I just, I like, I don't get it. Like, lots of people talk about Samoa Joe all the time, about how amazing he is, and I just don't get it. I don't get how he's, I, you know, I think he's good. I don't know that he's great. I just, you know, I'm not there. And then when I saw him live, I understood. When I saw him live, I got it. I saw how quick he was, how agile he was, how for a dude of his size, he was able to move like that. And I understood it, and I developed a new appreciation for Samoa Joe, and I never really saw him the same since. And Nakamura, for me, is a similar type of talent. Is that everyone had talked for so long about New Japan, and the strong style, and the striking, and whatnot. And I watched him, and I said, well, this guy's interesting, but, you know... Maybe a little bit overhyped. And then I saw him live and I got it. So, Shinsuke Nakamura and Samoa Joe is going to happen at NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. I think it's going to be an incredible match. I think it might actually be better than what people got with Finn Balor and Samoa Joe, which I was never really all that high on. I thought the matches were fine, but I never thought they were able to get to the next level. Samoa Joe and Nakamura, I think, has the potential too. In fact, I think Nakamura and Balor were better than anything we got out of Balor and Samoa Joe. But I think what we get with Nakamura and Samoa Joe, that might tear the roof off of Brooklyn. So keep an eye out for that as they build towards that match. But go back and revisit 
that NXT match this week with Balor and Nakamura and revisit it and watch it again and watch it again because I get the feeling that the more you watch it, the better it's going to get. And the more you understand sort of everything that's going on around the match besides what's happening in the ring, I think also adds to the emotion of it. So I think it's a top-notch match. I'm glad I got to see it. I'm glad everybody else now has gotten to see it uh, if, you, if you took it in on NXT. And if you haven't, drop everything you're doing right now. Just go put it on. I'll, I'll wait. Just pause me. I'll wait. Go watch it and then come back. Okay? All right. I got one issue, and I told you I wanted to take this up as far as NXT was concerned. Uh, once again with the fan base at Full Sail University. Um, so, I, like I said at the very, very beginning of the show, um, I was up in Orlando this week. I did go to the, la- the latest batch of NXT tapings, which are going to be um, the shows that lead up to and through um, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. So this, this is the build towards NXT TakeOver Brooklyn. Uh, I, I was originally uh, att- uh, supposed to attend the next round, the second round of the Cruiserweight Classics, which, to my knowledge, I've been hearing it was a fantastic show. Um, but I'm going to have to catch that one on TV. I was called back. I had to do a, an interview that you'll be able to catch on This Is Infamous uh, in a couple of weeks. But uh, I, I had to cut my, my wrestling road trip a, a little bit short. Um, and I'm not going to spoil what happened at the NXT tapings. Uh, I think there's some interesting things. Uh, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit uh, down uh, on what the build seems to be as they get towards Brooklyn. Um, I'll be interested to see how they sort of fill in the gaps, fill in the blanks with interviews and backstage segments to maybe flesh things out a little bit more. Uh, but, um, but I, I did want to take issue with with one thing um, that I observed and. Uh, experienced at at NXT. So it's it's kind of been a little bit of a of a rough uh week. Um it's been a rough week for myself, uh been a rough week for people around me. Um some some personal things got in, some professional things got in. Um and I I'd gone up to to NXT uh to Orlando as sort of an escape. Uh, I, I really just wanted to get away for a day or two days as it was originally planned and enjoy my passion, which is wrestling. I mean, it's why I do this podcast. Uh, it's why I talk about wrestling all the time. So my Twitter is like filled with, with conversations about wrestling. I, I love wrestling. I love professional wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever it is that you want to call it. And I really, I wanted to be able to go up to this nice, this, this setting that I really dig, uh, and watch these these talented individuals that that I'm inspired by on, on a number of levels as they chase their dreams and sort of check out of my my head, check out of my problems, um, and just enjoy some wrestling. And I was able to do that on, on a number of levels. I met up with some friends. There's, there's some really, there's some great people that are up there. And and I'm, and I'm not, I don't mean this as like an indictment of the entire crowd uh, at at NXT at Full Sail Arena. There are people who there who who love the product, much like me. They love wrestling. They like going to it. They like enjoying watching these these talents start out and grow and, and and find their way and make something of themselves. So I, I don't want you to think of of this as as sort of a knock on all of them. Because there are there are some some great people. I've met them. I'm 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 good friends with some of them. Um and, and I do enjoy not only their company, but I enjoy being able to share in this commonality of wrestling with them. Um, but with that said, and, and I've said this a number of times, uh, th- there, are, there are people out there that, that as a wrestling fan, um, they just bother the shit out of me. And I, I, I can't underscore uh, how detrimental I believe that they are to the perception of what a wrestling fan is, who a wrestling fan is, what wrestling fans are made up of. 
the type of person uh, that is a wrestling fan. And, you know, a lot of people, they clap and they cheer and they'll chant along and they get excited and they, they, they behave accordingly. And then there are people who don't. And this, these next few moments are about the people that don't. I've taken issue with the NXT crowd on numerous occasions. I think they go out there, and it's not all of them. Once again, let me, let me, let me be a little bit more specific. There's a particular group of them that go out there, and they think that the show is all about them. They call attention to themselves. They try to get themselves over. They spend more time trying to choreograph chants so that they could point to and say, Hey, look, uh, we got that chant. Ha ha ha. Look at what we thought of. Let's dance in the stands. Let's do this in the stands. Let's make it all about us. That's their focus. Let's make it all about us. Let's not make it about what we're seeing in the ring. Let's not create an environment for that to succeed. Let's try and make it about us. Let us be the stars of NXT 2. And I find it to be incredibly problematic. It's incredibly irritating. It's very annoying. And it feeds into one of the statements that I say all the time, which are wrestling fans can be the absolute worst. They could be amazing. They share something with you. If I wear a wrestling shirt, they're like, oh man, is that, is that a Finn Balor shirt? Oh, is that a Sasha Banks shirt? Oh, is that an NWO shirt? A Steve Austin shirt? Like, you know, there's a bond that we share. But these are the people I don't share any sort of bond with. And I'm going to point out an example because, as I mentioned, I went up to NXT to sort of get away from my problems. And I found that the problems immediately followed me due to the behavior of certain fans. Now, it was rather tame at this week's tapings. The chant choreography wasn't at its all-time high. But... This is this is at least one spoiler. But something that I figured you, you might be able to figure out anyway is that we're going to get Asuka and Bailey at NXT TakeOver Dallas. We're going to get that rematch. We're going to get Bailey competing to become a two-time NXT Women's Champion. That feud is going to be amped up a little bit to another level beyond what we got for their match at Dallas. A little bit more personal. And so there was a contract signing segment lined up between Bailey and Asuka. And Bailey went first and she cut her her promo and she laid out her her motivation, her passion for the title and regaining the championship. And went through her portion of the segment. And then Asuka took the mic and proceeded to begin to cut her promo. Now, for Asuka, English is very clearly not her first language. She knows some. I believe she's working on more. speaks with an accent and is trying to convey a story and emotion with English. And while her language skills aren't like my own, if you listen, you can understand. So it's it's sort of, it's not really broken English, it's just in the, in the works. And in her promo, right in the middle of the promo, there's one fan, he's a regular at Full Sail University, 
I'm not going to call him out by name because I don't think he deserves the recognition in any degree. But right in the middle of Asuka's promo, in his deep booming voice, he yells out, Can you please speak English better, please? Now, there were people around him who were clearly appalled. You could sort of hear the gas when people tell him to shut up. And for that, I commend those. Those are the wrestling fans that I want. The wrestling fans that... that stand up and tell other wrestling fans when it is that they're being assholes. Because this dude is being an asshole. But sort of at the moment I heard it, I cringed. And I was disgusted. And I became... I was put right back into the real world problems that we've been facing. And my escape was taken away from me. Now once again, I'm just... This isn't an indictment of the the Full Sail crowd... It's an indictment of one person. But all it does is take one person to ruin it for everyone. All it takes is one person to ruin that thing that you're really enjoying. So, if you see or hear one of your fellow wrestling fans behaving like an asshole, call him out on it and let them know. That they are an asshole. Because that stuff, there's no place for it in wrestling. There's no place for it in this thing that we love. And we need to try and make wrestling fans the best. Which is what they absolutely can be when we put our minds and hearts and passion to it. Because when wrestling fans are the worst, this guy. The NXT Full Sail Arena. That's who represents you. Alright, on that note, I'm going to give you the go-home cue and we're going to get the hell out of here. Uh, look, you make sure you follow me on all the social media accounts that we got over on Twitter, at The IWC Show. That's right, at The W the IWC show so make sure you follow as soon as we get a new episode up at any point in time that tweet will go out so add that one to your timeline at the IWC show for all the info when a brand new episode is posted at tis infamous that's for the mothership of this is infamous the good host of this particular podcast so uh, make sure you follow us there you can find the show uh, anytime it goes up uh, for shorthand at this is infamous so at tis infamous on Twitter, that'll also give you notification when we get a new episode up on the air. Um, follow me for my random ramblings and musings, my stream of consciousness from my brain to the written word at infamous kid, two D's at the end, at infamous kid for everything that I got to put on your Twitter feed. Over on Facebook, two pages for you to like Facebook.com slash tis infamous and Facebook.com slash Billy the Kid, two D's at the end as well there. Uh, all good discussions and comment threads for you to join in and participate in. So keep an eye on both those pages. Always good stuff posted there on a regular basis. The podcast can be found wherever your podcast can be found. So your preferred podcast distribution model, we are on it. So whether it's iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, um, Blueberry, SoundCloud, you name it, you can find us there. So just go out there and look for Intelligent Wrestling Conversation. All we do is we ask that you subscribe to the show as well as rate the show. So give us as many stars as you want. If you can comment, lead us some feedback so we can get it. But make sure you subscribe to the show so it is constantly brought to your phone or your tablet. However it is that you get your podcast, we want to be a part of it. So make sure that you subscribe to the show. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah. You can find me on a regular basis, my work at joeblow.com, as well as thisisinfamous.com. And, uh, yeah, with that said, let's see how this draft shakes out. So um, I'll be back next week talking more wrestling. We'll analyze the draft in the post. So uh, in the meantime, have yourself a good weekend. You have yourself a pleasant, immediate future. I'll see you back here next week. Peace.
Intelligent Wrestling Conversation has been a podcast presentation of This Is Infamous.